Oh, hello. <laughs> well, looks like we're doing a video. So, have you ever had any excess airsoft stuff that you just didn't want and wanted to see if you could try and sell it? Whether it be the whole gun, a patch, or even just a few mags that you don't use anymore and think you can make a quick buck on. Well, this video is for you. Recently, I made a guide on the buy and sell groups in the Airsoft community and how to properly maneuver them and make your own sales and buy stuff from other people. And it went over pretty well. Now, among the people who enjoyed it was Umbrella Armory, who encouraged me to make a video about it, to put it in an even more shareable format. Well, that's what this is. So in this video, I'm... So in this video, I'm gonna try and culminate five pages of an airsoft buy and sell guide into a single, hopefully less than seven minute video. But without further ado, let's jump on into this. This is by no means me setting the rules, but more of a, here are the guidelines, make your own decisions from here. Number one, PayPal is your friend. Payment will usually come at the end of the buy and sell process, but it is still the most important despite being one of the last steps. To avoid getting scammed or cheated out of the deal that you struck with whoever the buyer or seller or whatever, most people will use PayPal or another trusted third party protected money service. If you have a PayPal account, you can skip this because the reason to use it is pretty obvious. To prevent the possibility of getting scammed, most people will use PayPal or some sort of similar third-party protected payment service. I know Hopup provides one that is very highly acclaimed, but I personally have not used it, so I'm going to focus on PayPal for the specifics, but if you have another protected third-party payment source that you use, this probably applies to that as well. The key point is you need buyer protection. Let's go through a hypothetical situation to describe what I'm talking about here. Say you wanted a vest or a plate carrier, and you find someone selling one used on Facebook, Reddit, Hopup, whatever, for a little less than what it would cost brand new, but it was lightly used so you're not really getting much of a difference in the total product. You pay him $70 for what was probably a $90 PC, and after he receives the money, he cuts off all contact. He doesn't respond to your DMs, he never sends you a shipping notice, any no, no tracking or anything. He just completely ghosts you. You, my friend, have been scammed. But if you paid through PayPal goods and services, you can file a claim against that transaction. And then PayPal will look at your side, their side, all the evidence presented, and assuming that you provide evidence that you never got the product you paid for and he agreed to send you it, you'll get your money back. Now this can be abused in the opposite sense. The decision to refund you your money is ultimately PayPal's. It doesn't matter what you say or the other person says, they're the ones that make the decision, which leads directly into my second tip for you guys. Always keep records and receipts. In the event that there's a dispute over a transaction, evidence is the most important thing you can have to help your case. This is often in the form of screenshots of the sales post itself, messages with the buyer, and videos of the product once it's received. From the buyer's perspective, it is always important to keep records of the conversation with the seller, details on the purchase itself, and if you think it's valuable enough and you don't really trust the seller if he seems a little shifty, take a video of you unboxing the item with proof of no tampering to showcase the item in its condition immediately upon arrival. This is to guarantee proof of if it arrived as advertised or not. If you find that it came in worse condition than advertised or it didn't come at all, the evidence you compiled is going to help you make a claim to get your money back. From the seller's perspective, this is just as important. Just as there are scammers that sell items and never ship it, there are also scammers that buy items and then claim that it never came or came in a non-advertised state. 
These scammers will then file false claims to PayPal or to whatever service they're using and will try their best to make you look bad and look like you didn't follow through on your end of the bargain so they can essentially get the money as well as the product. Saving conversations, providing proof of shipment in the form of a packaging or shipment video or tracking information, and a timestamp proof of function in the event that you're selling an airsoft gun like this one here, will all help in the case that a dispute is filed. Another important step for the seller is to follow up on the arrival of a product. Message the person the day or the day after it's supposed to have arrived and ask them if they've got the package, if they've open, opened it up, how it looks to them, if they're satisfied and things like that. Because there are a lot of cases where someone will get the gun, they'll be really happy with it, and then a month later they break it and then try to spin it on, oh, I, it arrived broken, I want my money back. So getting that proof that they're satisfied with the purchase once it's arrived will help tremendously in the case that someone tries to take advantage of you. Tip number three, be specific in your listing. Now, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this one. You would be surprised how many people will post just a generic Airsoft AK or Airsoft vest with some ridiculously high price tag and not understand why no one wants to buy it. You have to be specific in what you're listing or else no one's going to be interested to try and figure out more information. It's important to, at the very, very least, give the brand and general product name of what you're trying to sell in the title. So instead of just saying electric M4, maybe say D-Boys M4 or SEMA AK or something that will give the potential buyers a general understanding of the level of product that they're about to buy. It's also beneficial to let them know the general usage of it. If it's lightly used, heavily used, brand new in a box, those kinds of things are very, very helpful. Trust me, you are only doing yourself a favor doing that. The description can be used to go more into specifics on what pertains in what you're selling. So you can elaborate on things like who pays shipping? Do you accept trades? Are you only shipping or are you only a local meetup kind of person? Things like that. Providing these details allows potential buyers to know exactly what they're in for and it sets a baseline for haggling. Tip number four, pay attention to the listings. So I've had way too many product listings that I put time and effort into making as specific as possible. And then I got messages from people who clearly didn't even look at the listings before shooting me a message on what to buy. So the price is shipped, right? No, my listing says buyer pays for the shipping. Is the whole lot still available? And how much for everything? The description lists every item individually and their respective price, and no, if you can look, some of them have been marked as sold. Would you trade for a high kappa? No. My post clearly says no trades. There are a lot of sellers who will simply ignore potential buyers who neglect to read posts before asking questions. It's a huge turnoff for a seller if the buyer isn't even willing to put in the little bit of effort it takes to read the post. There's also a term that I want to cover in this section to make sure that all newcomers to the buy and sell community, especially for Airsoft, truly understand and can maneuver around. And that is Boneyard. If an item is marked as Boneyard, then that means it's either in a non-working or an unknown condition. In terms of an AEG, the gearbox could be locked up or there could not even be a gearbox in it. Both would qualify as Boneyard. There's no standard condition that qualifies a product of any kind to be Boneyard. So if a seller is qualifying their own product as Boneyard, assume it's in a non-functioning capacity. Boneyard sales are final. There's no refunds on it. It's very much like buying a mystery box. You're taking a gamble on it and having it listed as such makes you aware that you are taking that risk and you might not get what you're looking for. Now, the reason I bring this up is from a personal experience, I have won a PayPal dispute as a seller because the buyer didn't understand what Boneyard meant. It all just ties into understand what the person is selling because if you don't, it's only gonna hurt you in the end. 
Tip number five, get verification. This tip should be used to confirm that the seller actually has the product that he or she is claiming to have so you don't get scammed. Before payment is made to a seller, always get confirmation of the product. This can come in the form of pictures with timestamps, pictures with the person's name next to it, a video for proof of its functioning, anything along those lines. Another form of verification that is incredibly important for shipping is receiving a tracking number. Now, this is common standard for anyone that sells anything. When you ship it, you send the person who bought it the tracking number so they can follow the purchase all the way until it gets to their doorstep. Now, it should be generally understood that if a person doesn't send you it or claims that they lost it or never got a receipt when they ship the item, that is an immediate red flag. Like, as red as this mag red flag. Look at this. Huge, huge, huge red flag right there, my dudes. Always get a tracking number because if there's no tracking number, there's no confirmation on your end that it was supposed to arrive. Now this next tip is about proper pricing and labeling. One of the most common points of conflict in the buying and selling world is how a product is priced. Think of it as, why would I pay $40 for this when I can pay 10 extra dollars to get it new? Pricing can be difficult, especially if you don't have as much reselling experience. There are varying thoughts and opinions on how to price items, and even more on how to sell rare or discontinued items. But here's a general guideline that you can follow that I'm gonna be placing right up on the screen instead of my beautiful face. If it's pre-owned but still new in the box, the resale value is roughly 75 to 80% of the current price. Being discontinued does not mean that it is rare or valuable. Rare and valuable are not one in the same. If the product is still available for purchase at a retailer, do not list it as rare. Used gas guns, uh, gas blowback pistols, and gas blowback rifles with one magazine are roughly only worth about half their original retail value, but extra magazines will add roughly 80% of the magazine's retail value per magazine for the overall worth. Now, if you have a custom airsoft gun, upgraded, customized, or modified in any way, the following formula is often used to calculate the gun's retail value. 0.65 times retail value of the gun plus 0.5 times retail value of upgrade parts plus 0.75 times retail value of accessories and add-ons equals resale value of gun. Now you do not have to follow these percentages or formulas exactly. This is just another set of the standard baseline what the majority will understand to do so you can do yours based off of this. It's more of a guideline and a jumping off point than a strict rule. Another key point in pricing is being flexible and willing to negotiate. With the resale value of guns and gear varying so much, it's not wise to be firm on your price. If you get a lowball offer, ugh, an offer significantly below the listed value of the item, for those who don't know, Give them a counter offer. This is the start of the haggling process. So you're gonna go back and forth giving each other counter offers until you either meet in the middle and find something that they're willing to spend or reach the very bottom of what you're willing to sell it for. It is a very common practice for sellers to raise the initial price of their items in anticipation of haggling so that middle ground that they typically reach is closer to what they wanted. Tip number seven is all about trading precautions. Trading can easily become the Wild West, so it's really important to understand what to do. And meeting at high noon is not one of those options. The risk of trading with someone online is that outside of a text conversation, there's really no evidence of a transaction taking place. When trading items, there's no PayPal or equivalent for buyer protection and trades are one of the most common transactions for scams to take place. Personally, I do not trade unless it's face-to-face, -face, allowing both parties to be present and not rely on trust that your package is going to the right place and that they're gonna send one back to you. 
But with the risk comes a certain amount of reward. If you decide to take the risk of trading, there are a few rules that might really help you to avoid getting scammed. Each party will usually cover their own shipping fee, but it's also commonplace to total the shipping and then split it evenly amongst both parties. It is also highly recommended to use a platform that utilizes vouchers, similar to what the app Hopup does with their voucher system. Do not trade with a person that has less than 10 vouchers. They're either too new to be trusted, or they've had to make a second account because it was taken down for a most likely not so great reason, if you catch my drift. It is 100% always recommended to reach out to a person's vouchers before you ever make a trade with them. This will allow you to gain firsthand experience of how they conduct business and if they're a common trader, how they typically will go about things and how trustworthy of a person they can be. When it comes to shipping in a trade, the person with the lowest amount of vouchers will always ship first. It's kind of like a respect thing. They have more experience in the game, so they have the benefit of the doubt when it comes to shipping. Then the other person will typically either ship when a tracking number is provided or when the product gets to their door. This part will be determined before the shipping of the first product though. That's something you gotta decide with the other person. And my final tip is on shipping. Listen up everyone, don't you dare ever ship something before you get paid for it. And I do not want to hear all of the complaints of how you were a dum-dum and did not get paid before you shipped it out to someone. Got it? Hopefully a lot of you guys watching this video were able to take something away from it at least. Whether you knew a lot of this before from a previous hobby or previous experience shipping things, or if you're brand new to both shipping and airsoft and you just wanted to make sure that you were doing the right thing, I just hope that this video was able to benefit you, and maybe entertain you along the way. If you enjoyed videos like this and my guides, or you enjoyed the writing of this actual guide that you checked out from the description down below, make sure to let me know, and if there's something else that you want me to cover, I'd be happy to try it. So, I'll see you guys next time. Get out of here. Come on. You're really gonna wait for the end card and the out outro? You're really gonna do that to me? You're gonna make me wait here this whole time? It's kinda awkward. A little self-conscious, honestly. All right, bye. Fade out. Thank you, okay. <laughs>